Um, is it, I'll play off of some of the other comments here. Uh, I agree with uh, Joachim that narratives are inherently a, a linguistic kind of practice. Um, on the other hand, I think that what we don't understand how this works very well, but I think by being exposed to a lot of narratives, we also create these, these underlying, the cultural DNA, if you will, that is something that we don't even know exists. Uh, and we just automatically, we look at an episode and we automatically see people doing things that um, has a story-like character to it, but it's not, that's why we have to have this, some notion of a schema or a narrative template or something <clears throat> that derives from the linguistic, but it, it's uh, in a very inchoate linguistic form, if it has linguistic form, eventually. And it's different for different places, so it's not universal unconscious or something I'm talking about here, but they, they belong to particular groups, that's why it's cultural DNA. I think um, the way that uh, they have their effect, it's come up a couple times, um, and Nino brought this up, uh, issue of uh, accuracy or truth is something we believe about narratives, um, but this gets to be very problematic and very misleading in a lot of ways, um, because uh, that's exactly where we get in these uh, conflicts conflicts and we cannot get out to say, I'm telling you the truth. And uh, the trouble is the guy across the table is also telling the truth. And there's nothing we can get out of this. So if, I think it's useful in that sense. Um, well, actually, I just, it made me think, I was thinking earlier today, there are two movies about the 2008 war. There's a Russian movie and a Hollywood movie. There's uh, a Russian television movie for Channel 4 in Russia. Uh, it came out first and it's called Olympus Inferno. Um, and there was a Hollywood movie uh, uh, called Five Days of War that came out about two years ago or something like that. What's interesting about both of these movies is, in both cases, they almost have exactly the same plot line in this respect. In both cases, um, the war is something that if people just knew the truth, then they would obviously see my side. But there's two sides. Mm -hmm. In both cases, they involve videos stolen videos, if they just had the video, and so it's a chase after the video. The, uh, in one case, the Russians have the video, and the NATO and the American and the Georgian guys are after them to steal the video, to destroy the video, because they know if, they, if it, people saw that video, then every, everybody would recognize. It's not a matter of narrative, they think, it's just, it's on the video, it's truth. The problem is they do exactly the same thing in the five days of war. If they just had the access to this record, then you, you'd have to see the truth. But they're conflicting truths, completely different truths. And, but then, so it raises the issue, you know, how do they have their effect in a lot of ways? Because I think there are two notions of truth here. One of them is what we can sometimes call propositional truth. You know, if you want to say, for example, who shot first? You know, you, you can find a time who, who shot the first shots, and, and I'm pretty convinced it was the, the Georgians, you know, but it was provoked and all that. But, um, that's what this UN commission kind of went through thousands of documents and things and came to, yes, they did start, they shot first, but the Russian response is disproportionate, that's the answer, the basic answer. But a propositional truth is at 11, you know, 2,331, 2300 hours and 31 minutes, uh, the Georgian forces unleashed a set of rocket, uh, a rocket barrage. That's, that's a propositional truth. You have evidence and you have a proposition. You look, does a proposition accurately describe the evidence? The problem is, and that's why we're talking about narrative, there's another thing called narrative truth. And that's the truth the issue in this case is not does this language match something, but is it the right story? So for example, all these uh, museums of occupation, you know, a lot of countries have museums of occupation. That is a story that you can get evidence for to some degree but nobody has a, a museum of collaboration. But yeah. the collaboration always happens too. <laughs> I mean, there's no such thing as, you know, no, American good. Civil War. Good uh, Americans have always had spies and traitors. I mean, Russians, you know, did it big time. Uh, Estonians. Uh, Estonians come closer to anybody I've ever seen to say, we have to tell their work collaborators too. They have whole chapters, big books, devoted to uh, Estonian collaborators. So. Um, that does, but they don't have a museum to collaboration, they have a museum to occupation. <laughs> so this is a narrative truth, and the narrative truth is which, what's the right story? And it's not something that a videotape could ever solve for you. It's, it's, that's propositional truth. 
So then it leaves you, okay, so Itai, I think that's the bottom line question. So what do you do about this? Is there any way, can you ever have a discussion if I have completely uh, conflicting truth with what you have? And I think, I mean, it's to Ralph's great credit that he keeps wanting to come back to this issue of reconciliation. And people say, oh, that's so naive, and you know, you can't do that. But if we don't do it, we'll never get there. The one thing I would add to reconciliation, I think it doesn't work unusually, in my experience, uh, unless people are very, in very calm material situations. I should say, uh, Ralph said something about getting a little bit too postmodern here. You know, um, there are material circumstances that make people fight wars too. It's not just, uh, I have the wrong story about you. You took my land, you know, and this is, uh, this used to be my material and now it's yours. So, but when we have relatively calm settings, and that's what you're looking for with time, as Nino talks about, um, you can start to, sit down and be willing to listen to somebody else's account, their different narrative truth. And really, my first reaction is to say, no, 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 I, that's not right. But then I say, well, actually, you know, they have a point there. I have to think about that. But I don't think that a lot of times just direct confrontation of competing narrative truths works. What, in addition, we might need sometimes. Sometimes it does. Sometimes we have what we call these teaching moments. You say, geez, that guy said something. I can't believe they said it. But I look at him and I realize he can't believe what I'm saying. And so that's, I have to rethink a little bit. Sometimes we can have these moments, but you have to be in a pretty calm, relatively good material condition to do that and not under great threat. Another addition, it's not the opposite of that, but it's an addition. Instead of narrative reconciliation, sometimes we should talk about narrative transcendence, I think. And the reason I think this is because maybe the best example we've had in the 20th century in America of somebody changing the American narrative is what the civil rights movement did, what Martin Luther King did to the American story. In America, we had people who thought it was natural order for black people to have to go. In St. Louis, you know, you could still find places where if you look hard, you could say, oh, this is a black drinking fountain. <laughs> this is a white drinking fountain. You know, so we had segregation. It was a fact of life in America, especially in the South and America and the United States. And along came Martin Luther King and a bunch of other people, but he was a great genius at this. And one of the reasons he was a genius is not because he said, we are going to march and force you white people to say, you know, you're, it's wrong to have segregation. He said, I want to appeal, as sometimes Lincoln said this too, I want to appeal to your, uh, your what do you say, the higher angels. angels? Higher angels. I want to appear to our, uh, appeal to our higher angels. And what Martin Luther King Jr. did was to say, you know, the aspiration of America, the great story of America, is that we treat all people, you know, all men are created equal. And he, he kept at this in a lot of ways. And what he did was he didn't make the American white, whites in America change their narrative of what America was, but he made us transcend, instead of talking about white Americans, he made us say, actually, this applies to all Americans. And he was successful in doing that after a while. So pretty soon he convinced white people, actually, my story is one that I have to let blacks into my society. So uh, and it's not because he confronted the story. It's because he redefined who the story, to, who, who that story is, is about. So we, he got us to rethink ourselves as white Americans, say, I'm, I'm an American, first of all. I'm not a white American. Uh, and, this, and that's getting in my way to think about this bigger story. So sometimes. For example, when you have this terrible earthquake in 1985, I think, in Armenia, sometimes we can, even the worst of enemies, and at that time you didn't have the Nagorno-Karabakh or anything, but you did have the Russians, even the Soviets, and there was conflict. But sometimes we can stop and say, actually, we have to think of ourselves as human beings for a while, because otherwise, you know, we all can feel. And so sometimes we make that kind of move where we try to do a transcendent narrative reconciliation. You say, look, you're a father. I'm a father. You know, we both have children, if you think about that. Too. And it, but it takes great genius, rhetorical genius, to do it. It's not something you can just put in a textbook. You know, we try this, and it does, it's not mechanical. Uh, it's political rhetoric. And um, there, so I'm not sure I have a very good answer for that, but I think it might be one example where somebody took the narrative we had, that we had about ourselves, and transformed them, tr made us transcend our local selves and convince ourselves, say, oh, that's my story. Uh, yeah, then I have to, I have to change because uh, that, that's, that's who I am. Uh, the old self that I was, he's kind of said, transcend that one level and think of yourself. So um, that's the biggest bottom line. I mean, what you can do about this, I agree. And um, 
maybe transcendence sometimes works. Uh, I think we can have a tremendous impact on education on young people. It's, young people really believe stuff that if you get them early enough, then they just think they don't, they just assume it's the natural order until you know, they confront something else. So we can have impact by reforming you know, these textbooks and things as well. Uh, and, uh, but of course they hear from other old people other than just their textbooks. So <laughs> there's competing narratives that work there. So I'm very happy to see this kind of discussion go on. Um, it's very difficult ahead of us, uh, but it's very exciting to think about what the possibilities might be. Uh, it's theoretical problems, but then there's practical problems as well. <laughs>